What's up, everybody? I'm Ken Crump. This is the Mainstream Evangelical Podcast. Today, we're going to talk about Christian nationalism. Um, Christian nationalism is something that's been in the news lately. It's been in the news for quite some time, ever since the last election. Uh, But it's been in the news lately because of uh, Turning Point USA had a conference this past weekend. Donald Trump spoke at it. Uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene spoke at it. Uh, Charlie Kirk, its founder, of course, he spoke at it and a number of other people. And the term Christian nationalism uh, has been in the news lately, so I thought it's time to address this now. I was going to address it later, but we're going to talk about it now. Um, In my book, Redemptive Deconstruction, we go into detail in the chapter about the church and politics. We go into detail as to what Christian nationalism is. It's not something that's uh, easy to grasp because there are some nuances with Christian nationalism, exactly what it means. There are different uh, variations of it, Um, so it's important to understand that. Uh, So before we go into specifically Christian nationalism, I want to talk about a number of other definitions of things. Uh, For instance, uh, patriotism, nationalism, white nationalism, fascism, all these things need to be addressed as far as those specific definitions because they all kind of work together with Christian nationalism. Now, I've created a graphic and I have already posted this on my account and I'm putting it up on the screen now. Uh, this graphic is something that really helps understand how all these terms relate to one another and create a situation where you have Christian nationalism. Now, if you're listening to this podcast, um, just the audio version of it, uh, that that's great. We also have a YouTube channel where you can see this video and you can see this graphic because it's a really important graphic. It helps for people to see things as well as hear them. Uh, it really helps uh, correspond with all these different uh all these different definitions and how they overlap and work together. Um, we have a YouTube channel that has the, vi- the video version of this podcast. And also, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, uh, but Spotify allows you to upload video podcasts. All our podcasts that you hear on Spot- Spotify, if you're just listening to the audio version, you're listening to the audio from the actual video. So the video is there as well. Um, I'm not, I'm pretty sure everybody has access to that. I don't, I don't think you need a subscription, but uh, in any case, YouTube's there. You can always look it up on YouTube and, and our Facebook page usually have a link to the, uh, uh, to the YouTube, uh, video as well. So first of all, let's talk about Christian nationalism. Um, the first time I heard the phrase Christian nationalism, I thought, here we go again, far left doing another mob hit on the church, trying to, uh, tie it to racist groups. But then the Trump administration and several conservative evangelicals seem to kind of live up to the stereotype. Okay, whether knowingly or unknowingly, I don't know, but it seemed you really couldn't argue against it anymore. Uh, The church in a broad interdenominational sense has always been affiliated with conservatives and conservative causes. But for the most part, at least this has been my experience, for the most part, the gospel or politics had always taken a backseat to the gospel. It seemed like the whole nationalism thing was kind of dying on the vine prior to Trump. Uh, Granted, it was a slow death, but it did seem like it was becoming more socially unacceptable in the white community. Unfortunately, the Trump administration, again, whether knowingly or not, has breathed new life into the white nationalist movement. Uh, So before we go into a specific definition of Christian nationalism, let's look at some related terms that all relate to the overall definition. The first thing we need to look at is patriotism. Uh, Patriotism is something you hear, you know, I think people on the right think they own patriotism and they're the only ones that are patriotic. Um, I would disagree. Certainly there are some people on the far left that are very unpatriotic and I think um, not helpful to our nation. Uh, But nevertheless, that's a, that's a, an issue for a different time. Uh, But let me give you a definition of patriotism. According to Merriam Webster, patriotism can be defined as quote, love for or devotion to one's country, unquote. Oxford Languages defines it as, quote, the quality of being patriotic, devotion to, and vigorous support for one's country, unquote. So certainly there's nothing really wrong with either one of these definitions of patriotism. patriotism. However, the way this term gets used by conservatives seems to go beyond that. Uh, The implication is that if you don't agree with my conservative agenda, then you're not a true patriot and you don't care about America. Maybe you're even a traitor. This is a distorted view of patriotism that would appear to be limited to a very narrow political view on the right. 
With that in mind, let me give you a def definition of what healthy patriotism is. It is a pride in one's own national identity as a nation comprised of numerous ethnicities, faiths, and socioeconomic groups. It's a consistent yet device common national identity that's inclusive, not divisive. However, when one's patriotism is confined to a conservative or predominantly white version of what America should be, that kind of patriotism can quickly morph into nationalism or even white nationalism. So let's talk about, first of all, let's talk about nationalism. So let me give you a definition of, of what nationalism is. This is the Oxford languages. Quote, identification with one's own nation and support for its interest, especially to the exclusion of or detriment of the interest of other nations, advocacy of or support for the political independence of a particular nation or people. Um, nationalism has to do with one's own nation and its cultural values taking priority over its relationship with other nations. The key term in Oxford's definition of nationalism is to the exclusion or detriment of. While every nation must uh, attend to the needs of its own people, with nationalism, um, this is taken to an extreme and comes at the expense of other nations. Uh, for powerful nations, this can lead to policies that, where they act as aggressors on the world stage, they become bullies that take advantage of other countries and refuse to work with the global community. They may even take uh, unilateral action militarily or economically. And this can become problematic because nations are more interconnected today than they ever were in history. And what one nation does has a ripple effect on all others. And this emphasizes our need for global cooperation among all nations. While nationalists aren't necessarily fascists, it's important to note that acting unilaterally at the expense of other nations is a primary trait of fascism. So I think it's important that we understand uh, the definition of this. Now, certainly all countries in all political leaders have to um, act in the interest of their country. That's a foregone conclusion. If you look at someone like Justin Trudeau up in Canada, uh, when Joe Biden took uh, the presidency, uh, he stopped the, I think it was the Keystone Pipeline, if I got that right. Um, he stopped that pipeline from, from, being, from being completed. This is something that really is economically good for America and Canada. I know environmentalists don't like it, but environmentalists are against it because they're just trying to stop anything that has to do with oil rather than come to a, a legitimate political conclusion. But that's, again, another... That's another discussion for another time. My point I'm trying to make with this is Justin Trudeau was upset with us because we stopped that pipeline. Now, Justin Trudeau is going to side with environmentalists, but he also has to take care of the interests of Canada, including business people in Canada and what that means to Canadian people. I mean, he's not stupid. Nobody gets elected being stupid. So that's an example of how you can see where Justin Trudeau, although I don't think by any means he's a nationalist, he's more of on the globalist side of things. Um, but in that particular instance, he has to do what he has to do. We all have to do that. The question is, how much are we going to do that uh, at the expense of other nations or at the expense of, because we all have to have treaties. We all have to have economic agreements. We have military alliances. There's all kinds of things we have to, because we have to work with the international community. And now more than ever, everything is interconnected. And you saw this with uh, COVID, with the pandemic, because we go back and forth between, you know, other countries. It's, it's crazy how many people fly back and forth and all over. It's constantly people coming and going in all these nations throughout the world. We see that. We see the effect that that had on everybody. Um, and you, you see other things also um, that affect other people no matter what you do. Uh, well, look at Russia, for example, what's going on there. Um, not only is Russia invading Ukraine, this had an effect on the response to that, the sanctions we took against them, um, and their counteraction with the flow of oil and natural gas to Europe, uh, and how that affected them, and how that affected uh, uh, the price of gas. Um, and not only that, but just, it, you wouldn't even think of this, but how there's famine in Africa, and a lot of the aid organizations aren't able to get wheat from 
Ukraine, because Ukraine supplied a lot of um, a lot of grain, a lot of wheat and other things uh, to these nations and help feed a lot of poor people. So now you have people starving in Africa because of someone like like a dictator like Putin is trying to invade and take over another country. You wouldn't think that, but it has a ripple effect. Everything we do has a ripple effect. So we have to learn how to work together as a global community, and that's very difficult to do, as we can see, especially when you have bad actors, countries like China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, who who are uh, always potentially dangerous. And there's other nations, too, that aren't exactly, um, uh, you know, on the up and up. So... All this has to do with nationalism. So what you'll hear a lot from conservatives in this regard, they don't call it nationalism. They call it America first. And this is nothing new. You can go all the way back to Pat Buchanan in the late 80s, early 90s. And he had an an American when he ran for president. He had an America first agenda. Um, You know, I was still pretty conservative back then. I didn't see it then, but I see it now what this is all about. America first is fine as long as you don't do it at the expense of others. But that's not what conservatives are talking about, or at least this version of conservatism, uh, the Trump version of conservatism and where we've gone to today with that entire movement. It is about us doing whatever we want to do, whenever we want to do it, wherever we want to do it, without any regard for other countries. And that is not a healthy policy for any democratic country. It is extreme. It is harmful to not only to other countries, but it's harmful to us as well. As a nation. So within every nation, there will always be a debate about balancing between acting in one's own interest and working in a cooperative manner with other nations. And while our cooperation with other countries is important, a nation must also balance at that with its need for sovereignty. Uh, In addition, no matter how powerful a nation is, history has demonstrated that all nations rise and fall. And any nation that was bullied in the past may want to return the favor after the fall of a previously dominant nation. Let's talk a little bit about fascism. Fascism originated in Italy just prior to World War II. While fascism started in Italy, the Nazis perfected it and nearly conquered all of Europe during World War II. Britannica gives this definition of fascism. Although fascist parties and movements differed significantly from one another, they had many characteristics in common including extreme militaristic nationalism, contempt for electoral democracy, political and cultural liberalism, a belief in natural social hierarchy, and the rule of elites, and the desire to create a Volksgemeinschaft. I'm not sure if that's if I pronounce that right. I probably pronounced that wrong. It's a German word that means people's community, in which individual interests would be subordinate to the good of the nation. That's Britannica's definition uh, of fascism. So fascism is not nationalism, but it contains many of the same elements. While this term is thrown around a lot in political circles, the type of fascism that existed prior to World War II no longer exists. While there may be leaders that mimic the fascism of the past, the world is a much different place today than it was 100 or so years ago. But the ghost of fascism still exists today and occasionally raises its ugly head, so we must always be vigilant to ensure nothing similar takes root. I think people need to be cautious when you throw that word around a lot because you tend to uh, uh, distract from the point you're trying to make because there definitely are some fascist elements and some nationalist elements in some people on the far right. And if you continue to use that phrase, I think it's, it's problematic because people stop taking you seriously. It's like calling everybody that's liberal a communist. Obviously, they're not all communists. Some have socialist uh, bends and some are. There are actual communists on the left, but, but very few. Um, so now let's talk about white nationalism. Uh, and this is the Anti-Defamation League's definition of white nationalism. White nationalism is a term that originated among white supremacists as a euphemism for white supremacy. Eventually, some white supremacists tried to distinguish it further by using it to refer to a form of white supremacy that emphasizes defining a country or region by white racial identity and which seeks to, te- seeks to promote the interests of whites exclusively, typically at the expense of people of other backgrounds. So white nationalism takes the traits of nationalism and internalizes them within a nation based on white supremacy. It promotes a white America at the expense of people of color. 
It represents white European descendants laying claim to a nation and suppressing people of color by limiting their ability to be part of positions of leadership, influence, and wealth. In a sense, it's a continuation of slavery by other means, where white people continue to prosper at the expense of non-white Americans. Uh, the United States was founded by British colonists who broke away from Great Britain to form their own nation. The same people exploited indigenous people and African slaves that were brought to America against their will. This is an unfortunate, sad truth about America. African slaves were kept in a stage of subjugation, first through slavery and later through laws and a cultural mindset, that propagates the idea that African Americans are inferior to white Americans. White nationalism is a view that's harmful to people of color, women, the poor, and other disenfranchised groups. Paul Miller of Christianity Today describes Christian nationalism as, quote, the belief that the American nation is defined by Christianity and that the government should take active steps to keep it that way, unquote. That's a pretty good, concise definition. Uh, like many political issues, it's not a simple one-size-fits-all definition. There are varying degrees of Christian nationalism that can bleed into one another. Not all conservatives or Christians are Christian nationalists. Not all Christian nationalists are white nationalists, and neither are all white nationalists Christian nationalists. Many conservatives have nationalist tendencies that many times are presented as an American first view, but the degree of nationalism can vary. While most Christian nationalists would stop short of establishing a Christian theocracy, they believe America is founded on Christian principles. They exercise a type of Christian privilege at the exclusion of other religions and secular society. They see America as their creation and inseparable from Christianity, an expression of a biblical worldview of government. They feel that liberals are destroying America Therefore, they feel the need to fight to keep America a Christian nation, or at least their view of one. Now, most conservative evangelicals would not see themselves as Christian nationalists. They've had many names throughout the years, such as the religious right, the Christian right, the moral majority, religious conservatives, whatever it's called. But let me, let me give you a definition, my definition of Christian nationalism. Christian nationalism is a disingenuous distortion of Christianity that corrupts the gospel message of salvation by mixing conservative political concepts with evangelical theology and nationalism. Although nationalism isn't necessarily racist, at the very least, it's open to white nationalist influences. Most evangelicals who are involved in Christian nationalism don't see themselves as racist and are offended by the accusation. Nevertheless, many of the policies proposed and enacted by Christian nationalist politicians are harmful to disenfranchised and vulnerable groups. While the gospel is a liberating experience, living under a fundamentalist caliphate would not be. Religious influence of government is fine, but religious control is not. From a faith perspective, the two biggest problems with Christian nationalism are that there's nothing taught or exemplified by Jesus or the apostles that would justify it, and it defames the reputation of Christ and the church.